Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to everyone uh, to our clergy benefits uh, and compensation workshop. Um, if you think you're here for something else, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, my name is John Sosnowski, um, canon to the ordinary. Um, happy to see all of you here today to learn about uh, the complexities of all of this. Um, probably uh, the thing, the area that we get the most questions over at Diocesan House about as phone calls are streaming into Diocesan House is about clergy compensation and benefits. And so, um, at least on the benefits side, that's an ever-changing scene with a lot of the changes in uh, medical uh, insurance, and you'll be hearing a ton of that this afternoon from representatives of the church pension group who will be uh, joining us later this morning. Uh, we have a day that's filled with a lot of information, so um, it is a little warm in here. We'll throw the windows open a little bit more to get some air circulating, uh, but um, uh, feel free along the way to get up and get help yourself to coffee and donuts and move yourself around so that you stay attentive to all of this uh, detail. If you're looking for a restroom, uh, they're located out this door down the hall on the left-hand side. Let's begin with a, a couple of prayers. First for our church. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. For the human family, O God, you made us in your own image, and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We'll begin with the front of the agenda, uh, and we'll be starting uh, the presentation talking about uh, clerical compensation. And there's no better person to do that than the chair of our uh, compensation uh, committee, uh, Valerie Balling. Good morning. So uh, many of you were invited to bring your laptops, computers, other devices. Um, we seem to be having a difficulty at the moment trying to figure out what the password is. We thought we knew what it was, but it's not what we think it was. So you, you can't get on at the moment? Still can't get on. So bear with us. <laughs> um, also, we just wanted to let you know that uh, this, the presentations you're seeing today, this is all being videotaped. Um, so. You can tell your friends and loved ones that if they are dying to know this information, it will be available in a uh, video format uh, for them to see and uh, review later. So somebody was asking me if these um, slides would be available. Um, 
today. They're not, but if you really want them, we can make them available to you. But this whole thing will be videotaped so you can have an opportunity to go back or uh, find some more information about it. Um, as John said, my name is Valerie Balling. I am honored to be the chair of the Standing Commission for Clergy Compensation. Standing Commission is a fancy term that really matters as far as the canons go because that means it's uh, an elected commission. Um, uh, one of those things that we do at the, at the diocesan convention when we have um, elections is you vote for members to participate on this standing commission. Um, there are six clergy and six lay. We find it is very important to have the uh, balance and input of, of all orders. Um, so uh, I just wanted to point out for you, uh, as many of them will be offering uh, some of today's presentation, but just so you know who they are, most of them are sitting at this table. Um, we have uh, Tal Kramer, um, Arthur Penderson, Peterson, sorry, I knew I was going to mess that up, um, Margaret Sturkey, and Daryl Vine. Um, several other of our members were not able to be here today, including um, Dirk Rankin, Louise, what's her last name? Highland, that's right, um, and uh, Bob McGonigal. Um, actually, at, unfortunately, we, oh, Connor, Connor's standing back there, sorry. <laughs> Connor Haynes is also part of our uh, membership. Um, we've had several people for extenuating circumstances um, uh, have to resign from the commission. So if you're interested, we would love your input. Clay, Clay. Lay and clergy. We need we need um, all voices, and uh, it's a it's a three year term. We meet about seven eight times a year, uh, and you'll see through our presentation today what it is that we do. Um, so we know that it's an important factor of the life of our congregations, and we want people informed. So we don't want to look like we're doing our work behind closed doors. Um, as we go through our presentation today, uh, you will notice that everything kind of doves tails on the other thing. So um, if, you ha if something comes up during the presentation that strikes a question about taxes, we might say, that's a fantastic question. Wait until Bob comes up. If something comes up about um, uh, uh, benefits, we might say, that's a great question. Wait until the benefits committee comes up. Um, we, we, we want to see like, where our expertise is and where it isn't. Um, so some of the things we'll be able to touch on and some of them won't. The other thing about clergy compensation, it is also highly contextualized. I know just looking out at the people that are here, I can tell that every one of you has different um, particularities about your situation. Some of them we'll be able to uh, talk about and some of them we won't. Uh, so please, please, if you have a very specific question, we might ask to talk with you offline, um, but we want to make sure that you get your questions answered as best to our ability. Um, so just uh, know that, that uh, we understand that, that everybody's got their own situation uh, and we want, want to make sure that you have the best information possible. So I think that's enough of an introduction. So with that, I'm going to ask Daryl to come up and start. Good morning. Good morning. I don't normally need a microphone, so oh, okay. I, but I have to use the microphone. So um, I'm. My name is Daryl Vai, and I was elected to this committee. This is my first year, and I am a proud member of Christ Church Bordentown. So I'm going to do the overview. So we wanted to talk today about the basic philosophy of compensation. So as we all know in Luke 10, 7, a worker deserves to be paid. But positions do vary in responsibility. A rector versus an assistant. And experience matters. And it should be acknowledged. Clerics in the early years of ministry need support. And clerics in their latter years need some flexibility. So there's different parts of compensation. It's not just one bucket, right? There's different pieces to it. There's the cash stipend piece. There's the housing subsidy or the housing equity piece. Self-Employment Compensation Act, which is your SECA, that offset. 
We have pension assessment, professional expenses, continuing education, and benefits. So today, we're going to talk about all of these subjects in all of the following slides. And now I'm going to turn it over to Art. Uh, my name is Arthur Peterson. I am from, uh, well, I'm the vice chair of the commission. I am also a member of St. John's Church in Woodbridge and have been there for a number of years. And uh, the um, part of why I'm in this commission is because of the experiences we had and what we needed to know. And uh, so those of you who see anything about what has happened with St. John's Woodbridge, it was because I think we bought into what this commission does as the way to compensate our clergy person. We were able, we had a parish, there's two parishes that were heading for extinction and we turned it around because we put together a package to go out and hire clergy that could do something for us that we looked attractive in what we were doing. Having said that, let's look at what we have on the, uh, this uh, chart. Um, things that you need to do know to get that to happen is to be aware of the uh, a minimum salary for a the curate newly ordained is $33,092. Um, for all other positions, including interim clergy, it's $35,795. That is the minimum for someone with basically zero years of credited service, which is what we talk about next on this. Minimum uh, <clears throat> is multiplied by 2.5% for each credited service year. What is a credited service year? Credit service year is a year of credited service for that clergy person with the pension fund. And uh, Mother Valerie's going to give us a little run on this. So most of the clergy in this room hopefully have received a piece of paper that looks like this. And it says at the top, your personal information summary. I just got this this week. Um, and it's got this helpful line right here that says credited service CS through... June 30th, 2015, and then there's a number. And for me, it says 9.96 years. Um, I think we could round that up to 10 and be perfectly fine. Um, this is the document that clergy need to have at the ready and to be able to know exactly when we're talking about CS, this is what we're talking about. And when you're doing your calculations for this coming year, you can say, give or take, a year, half a year, whatever, to make sense for when you're putting that information in. We're actually, we'll be going over that chart uh, where this information comes in uh, that you need to know that number. Um, there are some clergy in this diocese who have one reason or the other have not participated in the church pension fund. Okay, understand that. We're gonna trust that you know how long you've been ordained and uh, have worked in the church and that you can use that number. And if there's a problem, talk to us. OK. Um, <clears throat> the, we have a break point in the uh, chart, which uh, at 2.5% for the first 10 years is what it increases each year. And then from 10 to 20 years, it goes up 2%. Um, we, um, want to emphasize at all points that these numbers are minimums. This is, you cannot pay the clergy below that amount, but you can negotiate a higher amount. That's good for the clergy to know. It's also good for vestries to realize. And some cases, and in some situations, a higher amount is certainly warranted. We would hope that it would be in all cases, but the, uh, these numbers are minimums, which we the diocese requires. Um, well, actually, when I say the diocese, the convention does because this amount is voted on by the convention and it is not something that we just impose. We, we recommend as part of the commission, but it is set by the convention. Um, <clears throat> we also would note that a cleric is considered newly ordained for three years. That would be, go back to the amounts we have for uh, the newly ordained, the first number. Um, and as an example, we show a cleric with eight 
years of accredited service has a base stipend of 43,613, whereas a cleric, cleric with 15 years would be at 50,590. Yes. We didn't include that in this. We have a requirement in this thing that says the um, a, a cost of living increase. After 20 years, you would either negotiate with the clergy person, uh, but it, as a minimum, you must meet the COLA increase of well, whichever, whatever it is. 1%, 1.5, 2%, whatever the cost of living increase is, that would go in for those after 20 years. And uh, automatically, plus whatever negotiation you ca uh, came to. Yes? Oh, you didn't? Oh, the question was, uh, what happens for a person after 20 years? We've got a 2.5, the first 10, and then 22% that. After the 20 year point, it becomes the uh, COLA amount would be the increase that would be mandated in this process or a negotiated amount. If it's more than the COLA, then that's fine too. But uh, the, uh, any other questions? Any other questions before I move on to this? Um, <clears throat> the housing subsidy. Yeah. These, sli uh, these slides, I believe we're going to work on making them available, yes. They're, uh, they're not currently out there, but they will be. Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> um, the housing subsidy amount is for clergy who live in their own home. That is, the clergy person buys a home, it's theirs, and we have this, uh, this uh, subsidy of uh, $16,000 is the current allowance for that. Or if they're going to rent, they would get that, if they were gonna go out and rent their own place. The housing equity is for cler clerics who live in church-owned property, such as a rectory or apartment. The equity amount is $2,300. Now, for those who wonder what that is about, the equity amount is to give the clergy person some kind of building equity, which he would have if he owned his own home. Something, a concept that which uh, may not occur to a lot of people, but to a person like myself who grew up in a rectory for 21 years and went on out into the world, the realization that at some point in time my parents are gonna retire and where are they gonna go when they don't have a rectory anymore? That equity money that they're getting from this amount gives them a, a basics to buy a house with and move on to some place and stuff so they don't move in with me. <laughs> and. Uh, that I, it's an important concept that we uh, developed in the church and uh, is well used and well thought. Um, housing equity may be added to a 403B. This is tax purpose stuff that uh, what works, some, there's options that the clergy person can use. They need to know about it and they need to check with their tax person to set up the best way to do this. Uh, for IRS purposes, clerics should have uh, vestries pass a parsonage allowance resolution each year to establish a non-taxable income for their housing. That amount can be more than the subsidy. And that's a little bit more involved for tax purposes, but uh, any questions at this point? Yes, ma'am. Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> My answer to that is it's negotiable. If the vestry says we cannot provide the $16,000 and we only have this 2300 $2, and that's a deal breaker, then that's not a true call. And um, I think that it's important for churches to be able to see what they're able to do and, and to not um, and for, the, for the, the clergy to say what they can and can't do. Um, I think that it's, I, I never want to see either one felt like they're put over a barrel because that's not fair. If part of the package that the church is able to give is housing, then that the cleric has to, has to say whether or not they accept that. If they don't, then they've got to find another position. Yes. Vestry meeting. It doesn't need to be the annual meeting. It's a vestry meeting. It has to be done before the next year. 
right before the Murray. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The, right. Understand. The question was the um, parsonage allowance resolution, whether that needed to be passed by the vestry or the annual meeting of the parish. And then the answer is the vestry would meet that. And it must be done before the start of the year, the tax year that we were going, it's for. Any other? Oh, yes, another question. The 2300 equity amount is taxable or not taxable depending on how the clergy person handles the money when they get it, whether they, whether they put it into a, I believe, 403 b account will will make it tax, not tax, but there's, they can do several things with it, and that's best worked out between the clergy person and their tax preparer, how they're going to do that. That's not something that the vestry needs to fully pull. Well, go ahead. Just real quickly, um, if the if the cleric chooses to have it put in the 403B, then they literally don't take possession of it. The church needs to put it into the into the 403B. Um, you do both. Okay. Well, fine. I mean, again, it just it depends on whether or not it appears on the W-2, and Bob can talk a little bit more about that. Did uh, yes. I believe that is correct. Yes. It would need, this is whether, uh, has to, the question had to do with the balancing of the uh, annual compensation and the housing allowances and how you present that in the form. That needs to be looked at from the standpoint of how the taxes are going to be handled on the uh, part of the clergy person and the parish. And those things should be uh, set in that process. What Cecilia is saying is a very good point: is the fact that any money that the ch that the cleric receives is essentially the base, the, the cash that the cleric gets. But we make the point about saying that the parsonage allowance is different from the housing subsidy. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more in the next slide when we talk about uh, about fair uh, rental value of property. But the reason why we say that the that the parsonage amount could be more than the sixteen thousand is that. Just to give you round numbers, say for instance, the property is $2,000 uh, a month, that's $24,000 a year. Um, so the, the, the priest or cleric can go to the vestry and say, the parsonage and allowance is $24,000. That's quite a bit more than $16,000, but it's completely legal to do that if you, as long as you can prove that. So that's why we just wanted to explain that there's a difference between the, the buckets, if you will. We any other questions or clarifications? Go ahead. Okay. Okay, the next part is the SICA offset. Uh, SICA stands for Self-Employed Compensation Act, I believe. It's, we have that titled out somewhere, but um, for confusion purpose brought on by the um, I guess I should be nice and call him in the Internal Revenue Service. I occasionally like to call him the Infernal Revenue Service, but uh, they, um, they have these, this terminology uh, or set up for the, with the clergy 
where they are considered self-employed for some purposes and employed uh, employees for others, other purposes. They get, for example, they get a W-2 form for their compensation, which is an employee, whereas a self-independent contractor would normally get a 1099. Um, but for this purpose, they're considered uh, self-employed, that is for Social Security and Medicare purposes. Um, and the FICA is brought in here because FICA is what the rest of us put in when we're working, we pay, and that covers our Social Security and Medicare money. And um, it points out the employer pays 50%. The diocesan minimum for a church to pay is 50% of the SICA that the clergy person would own. Um, <clears throat> the income includes a housing subsidy or housing equity if taken as taxable income. And then the SICA is, is calculated by multiplying all income by 7.65%, half of the total of 15.3%, which would be the, the tax normally, but the, the uh, employer normally puts in half of that money. So are there any questions for this one? Yes, sir. Uh, no, the clergy should get a W-2, not a 1099. Right, even though for this, the calculation of these purposes is as, as self-employed, but the uh, they get a they get a W-2 form for their uh, their money. And, uh, okay. Yeah. I forgot to put this on the slide, but the best practice for this is. Um, uh, for when this uh, calculation is made, that this money is given to the cleric, and then the cleric pays quarterly taxes. It's very easy to set it up online. Very easy. Um, there are some churches that do it for the, the cleric, but sometimes, oh, well, the light bill is due and we don't have enough money, or the water heater needs to be replaced or something. Um, not paying your taxes is a really bad idea, and you can get into a lot of trouble. Um, I encourage you, emphatically, have a professional tax person who knows how to do clergy taxes. That's read, do not go to H&R Block. Professional tax person who knows how to do clergy taxes to tell you what your estimated taxes should be set up a savings plan for yourself so when you get your your paycheck you take that money put it aside into a savings account and when the quarter comes you have that money set aside in order to pay your taxes this is it's very crucial because if not there have been a lot of as bob just told me a lot of tears a lot of agony with people that were faced with twenty thousand dollars or more that they didn't know where to pay, how to pay um, because they didn't understand they needed to save that money. Okay. Um, actually, were, any, were there any other questions on SICA at this point? We've got a little part here. Uh, SICA calculation for those who live in a church provided housing or rectory. The church needs to know the fair rental value of the property. Um, we have worked in a discussion we had about these slides the other day, we changed this to fair rental value because oftentimes if you're reading documentations, it talks about fair market value. And that leads to a confusion, having done real estate for a while in my lifetime. Fair market value usually is understood to mean the price that the house would sell for if you're selling the house. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the rental value of the house if you were renting the house, what you could put it on the market for. Oh, oh yes, and furnished, that's right. It's a furnished uh, house also. What it would be the fair rental value of a furnished house. And you can get more detail on that later with the, when we're dealing with the tax thing, but uh, that is important to know. Uh, <clears throat> the church needs to know the cost of all utilities paid for by the church. Water, get electric, gas, cable, phone, internet access, etc. That goes into the uh, calculations of uh, funds here. Uh, the SICA is calculated by adding together the cash type and the fair rental value and all the utilities. 
Uh, housing equity is included only if it is taken as taxable income. We discussed that earlier, I think, uh, in detail. Are there any, any questions on this part of it? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, the question is the most common way to determine the fair rental value. Um, <laughs> we've had several discussions on this. Um, one of them that would probably be the safest would be to find a real estate agent and ask them to give you a, uh, here's, the, here's the property, what can I put this on the market for as a rental property? If I were renting this out, how much would I be able to get? That is probably your safest way to have something in writing from them that said this is the, the value. And um, there are other ways of doing it. For example, there's a wonderful app called Truvia um, that will give you um, Truvia um, that, that uh, it's a real estate app and it will show you available properties. It will also give you rental properties of the area. And what's important is to remember that this is the true rental value, not the church saying somebody needs housing, oh, we'll give it to them for $1,000, what it is actually would rent for in the open market to anybody who would be coming in. Um, and if somebody in your congregation, like, like Arthur, who's really good at real estate, has an idea about that, I, um, th that's fine. It just has to be a, a, a reasonable approximation of what that actually would go for. Again, it's important that it's with, with furniture that it's not just an empty building. Any other questions? Okay. The pension assessment, and I think this is where I was gonna end, my fourth one, I believe, right? Uh, all active clergy, if not retired, will receive 200 more from a same employer for three months in a row are required to pay into the pension fund. Uh, this looks kind of like, oh yeah, well, what do you mean? What this is intended to do, folks, is to prevent a parish from hiring a supply person as their full-time clergy person or their continuing clergy person for the year at, at supply rates of like $100 to $200 a month. Any two, two services is 200 a, a week, I think. So you pay the person $200, and you expect them to be the priest for as you go along. Or as, as This is designed to keep parishes from kind of working a deal like that. And it also um, is also important that you understand this, because if you go and hire somebody, you can hire a supply person weekly, and if you're good, you just have them do the Sunday services. But if you pay them this amount of money, you owe pension money to the, to the uh, church for them. And if you don't pay that pension money, guess what? You may forget about it, and three years later, when somebody's thinking, you're going to get a bill for what you owe, and it's 18% of what you paid them, which at 200, uh, if you paid $1,000 a month, that's $180 a month for uh, 12 months, and uh, you know you can wind up with a five, six, seven, ten thousand dollar bill that most parishes can't just pull money and, and take care of. So you need to be on top of this as it's happening. Uh, the, pen, the, pen, well, the pension assessment is currently 18% of the cash stipend, the housing seeker, and any bonuses. Um, and a cleric must earn 18,200 a year in a 12-month period in order to, turn, uh, to earn one credited service year. That goes back to the credited service year. We don't need to discuss that again, I don't think, but uh, you've got something else to add. What's really important to recognize is that um, as we'll, we'll, when we get into the actual chart, um, our part-time clergy will probably be making more than 18-2. Um, so as far as the diocese is concerned, they're not full-time. But as far as the pension fund is concerned, they are, okay? It's, it, it's, it's important um, to make that distinction so that um, when, it, when they're trying to calculate their pension um, 30 years from now, that they're not, they're not docked. Um, there was a couple of, of clergy that got kind of caught in the middle of this before CPG, Church Pension Group, um, made, made this, uh, this bottom line, if you will, of what they considered uh, a credited service year was. So 
um, I don't know if anybody's in that situation, but it's just important that as far as CPG is concerned, regardless of whether or not you're considered full-time or part-time, that's the, that's the threshold. Are there any other questions? I guess we're set on my part. I'm ready to turn this over. Oh, yeah, the, this one moves it forward or this one takes it oh, back. Okay, I'm Father Connor Haynes from St. Mary's Church in Burlington. Um, are you confused yet? Are you thoroughly confused yet? If so, we've done our job. It is confusing, and there are, as you've seen already, there are a number of different aspects of this whole idea of clergy compensation. And there are, depending on how you slice it, there are two or three different ways of emphasizing the importance. The first is, of course, the most important part is making sure that the clergy are fairly compensated. Uh, and then the parish has to know, and, and it puts you really in the human resources department, and that can be very uh, tricky, knowing, as we've said, how it is that that compensation needs to be paid and documented for tax purposes, which we'll hear more about uh, presently. And the other thing is for parishes to have an understand or congregations to have an understanding of what it costs to, su to support a cleric either full-time or part-time or even supply or interim in order that they may have a realistic understanding of their budgeting and their budgetary needs. It's important to par for especially parishes that are in the search process as Cecilia would point out parishes that are in the search process have to know what it is that the financial implications of that are so that they can make uh, appropriate decisions. Having talked about uh, cash stipend, housing subsidies, housing equity, housing expense allowances, those terms are, are tricky and, yet, and we'll, we'll hear more about those. We can get those straightened out later as necessary. We go into some of the other uh, aspects of clergy compensation. As uh, Art pointed out, most of these are established by the diocesan convention, so these are policies, these are not options, although there is always some uh, adjustment, negotiable adjustment upward. Uh, one of these has to do with professional expenses. It, we're required as parishes to provide for the professional expenses of clergy at a minimum of $4,500. It can always be more if a, cler if a cleric has expenses that are higher than that and the parish wants to cover those or reimburse for those. It can be more, but it's a minimum offered amount of $4,500 a year. And that can include anything that seems reasonable. Um, most congregations that I know of now don't provide a car for the cleric to drive. My parish certainly doesn't. I, have, I own my own car. But I keep track of the mileage. It's important that you keep track of the mileage of your clergy. It's important that you keep track of the mileage in a documentable way uh, on a regular basis, and then you can be reimbursed for that mileage. Current IRS rate, I believe, is uh, 56 and a half cents a mile uh, for mileage. Uh, that changes from year to year, or can change from year to year. You can always find that um, information online if you need to. Um, but that mileage reimbursement, of course, co covers gasoline, automobile uh, wear and tear, and all that kind of stuff. So mileage is one of those things. Uh, books. Uh, that the cleric might use, or uh, I, we don't talk about videos anymore, but uh, DVDs or anything of that sort that the cleric might use in teaching, um, vestments, clergy clothing within reason. Now that gets a little bit of a gray area, if, if you should pardon the expression since I never wear gray, but uh, clergy shirts, clergy shirts count because nobody wears clergy shirts but clergy. Black suits? No because anybody, actually black suits are kind of popular nowadays. So, so clergy can count their specific clergy clothing or, or vestments as a professional expense. You can't count your dockers, I'm sorry. But uh, professional expenses of that kind, computer, 
uh, that you're going to use in your uh, clerical responsibilities, and there, may, there are undoubtedly other things as well. But all of these things are clergy expenses and they can be reimbursed. It's important to point out that they can be reimbursed. You can get in trouble with this because for clergy, the best way to do this is keep track of these expenses, submit those expenses to the vestry on a regular basis and be reimbursed for them. This is called an accountable plan. That is, you account for your expenses and then you're reimbursed for them. Don't, if you're a, if you're a vestry, don't do this. If you're a cleric, don't do this. Pay or receive this housing allowance on a regular basis. Uh, no, have professional expense, I'm sorry. This, this professional expense allowance on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, $4,500 a year, uh, you're going to add $180 or whatever it is to your cleric's pay uh, every month. Don't do that because that can cause real tax problems. <laughs> uh, when I was newly ordained, we did things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word uh, for devaluing something over time? Uh, amortization and depreciation, we did that. Uh, but it's very complicated. You can still do it, but it's very complicated. Much easier if you are if you use an accountable plan where the cleric says, I drove uh, 250 miles this last month, and at 56 and a half cents, it's yay much money, and then you're reimbursed for that. If, if just one second, I'll finish up the last line. If you receive that as an accountable plan, it doesn't appear on your taxes. It does not appear on your W-2. If you receive it as a cash payment on a regular basis, then it does have to appear on your W-2 and it is taxable unless you follow some kind of depreciation amortization plan, which we could hear more about, but we really, I, I discourage that. It's just too complex. Yes, Don. Yes, that's correct. Uh, tolls, parking, um, and anything, uh, and uh, yeah, bridge tolls, whatever, all of those things, but, you need to keep those receipts in order to, it's always good to keep receipts uh, for, and, and uh, in order to submit them for reimbursement. Right, that's correct. This is, this is a good point that if you commute to the church, and I'm fortunate because my commute is exactly one block, <laughs> so I don't usually drive, but uh, if you commute to the church, that is not, a reimbursable expense. That is simply part of life. Uh, as any of you in secular employment know, uh, commuting and work travel is are two different things. So if I commute to the church, no. Trips to the hospital, trips to the uh, for, for pastoral care or diocesan events or conferences, those things all count, but, but commuting does not. Any, any questions on that? Yes. If you reach the maximum $4,500, that would be a negotiable situation. That would be where the cleric uh, would say to the vestry, I have had this many legitimate expenses. It's September. I've hit the $4,500. Can we, can we increase that? And the vestry might well say, no, I'm sorry, we can't. We don't have that money. Or the vestry might say, well, yes, certainly we can, we can see what that is. But of course, this is something where the cleric has to plan pretty carefully about uh, expenses and investments and so forth, and you don't buy the new uh, solemn mass set if you know you're going to hit the $4,500. Yeah. Just real quickly, if that is the case, as far as mileage goes, the cleric still can claim that on their taxes. So there wouldn't be out with that because one of the things my tax accountant always asks me, is there any travel that wasn't reimbursed? And Normally there isn't, but um, just real quickly, the other thing is that, and I do that, this at my church, I make the vestry put the line item of 4500 I don't always use the 4500 which is nice because then we have a little bit left over at the end of the year, but it's, I, I want us to understand that it, because it's canonically mandated, it needs to be there. Um, they were getting into this, this, this habit of saying, well, the other guy only used 2500 so that's what we're just going to put in there. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. No, that's not a good practice to get into. You need to be honest about what the canons say.
Yes, sir. I was about to address that, yes. That's correct. The question was, uh, your question was, if you go over the $4,500, what do you do? The question over here is, if you don't have $4,500 worth of reimbursable expenses, what do you do then? Uh, there are two things that you can do. My own practice is, uh, if, we don't, if I don't have $4,500 worth of uh, reimbursable expenses, the parish just saved a little money. Uh, the other option would be that the, the vestry might decide to, if you've got $1,000 left over, to give that to the cleric as an additional camp cash compensation. But if you do that, then it is a taxable amount and has to be declared and tax has to be paid on it. Hmm? It's a bonus, yes, but you would have to pay taxes on it. That's right. You can always add it to your fair share for the, for the diocese. It's important to keep the couple of things in mind here as you go along. And I, I should say the other thing that's important for vestries to understand is the whole philosophy of how it is and why it is that they're paying their, paying their clergy. They don't always understand things, as we were saying a bit ago, that the cleric is considered self-employed for some reasons and an employee for other reasons. It's an anomalous position to be in, and it's important for the vestry to understand that. And just little things that we were, we'll hear more about this, I'm sure, but we were, we were talking about self-employment uh, tax compensation. The, par the parish is required to pay half of that, as uh, secular employers do. But the cleric is required to pay self-employment tax on the half of the self-employment tax compensation they got. So again, it really does get very confusing. Continuing education uh, is another one of the benefits that uh, the diocese requires at a certain amount, at least $1,117 in round numbers uh, for continuing education for the clergy every year. Uh, clergy are required to uh, participate in some kind of continuing education uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, clergy may or may not use that uh, for in, in a particular year, although it's worth noticing, uh, in a, worth, worth noting that there are some diocesan events such as the annual clergy conference, which is in October, uh, November. Um, that's that's a, uh, a con continuing education opportunity, continuing education expense. Uh, if that isn't used in a particular year, it should be escrowed up to a period of seven years. So in round numbers, if after seven years your cleric hasn't done anything or spent any money in continuing education, you might want to ask him why that is, but you also should have uh, $7,700 stacked up uh, for continuing education. It's part of the planning, it could be part of the planning for a larger continuing education undertaking, such as a class in seminary uh, in a summer program or something of the sort, or even uh, perhaps a clergy sabbatical, uh, which is, you know, that's, that's another topic for another time, but it's, uh, we're, we're in conversation about how clergy sabbaticals happen. Um, any questions? Yes. That's a good question. The question is, if you have accrued monies over time for continuing education, it's, and it should be put in a designated account, uh, I will not get into the niceties of that because I'm not an accountant. But I will say that is something that the church should hold. It's not something that the cleric should hold. Uh, and if, uh, without going into confusing details, if after seven years you don't have $7,700 because you know, the cleric has spent some of that along the way, you've still got the unspent amount uh, in, the, in, that, in that parked place. But it is important to have these monies and not just stick in IOUs because, of course, at the end of seven years, uh, the cleric says, okay, I want to go off to uh, 
for $4,000 to participate in a clergy enrichment program at such and such a place, and the parish says, well, we don't have $4,000. You can't, you can't be doing that. You really have to have the money on hand, and honesty is really important. Yes? If the cleric leaves and you still have money in that account, then you can use that for something else because you're going to start over with the new cleric. Yeah, that's, that's yes, yes, because you got a new cleric um, and it's a new, new individual. But no, it's not something that belongs to, to the cleric, and so you can't take it with you when you go. Um, you know, severance and, oh, by the way, here's the rest of your continuing education. No, you can't do that. What's that? Well, that's right. I, I should say, as uh, without without an indication of being personally invested in this, you could always give it to them, but it would be taxable. And then, of course, there are the other benefits, which uh, we're going to talk more about this afternoon, I believe. But in addition to the uh, uh, retirement, Social Security, uh, I mean, pension, church pension fund, and then, of course, Social Security, uh, compensations because with very few exceptions all clergy are required to participate in the social security system as well um, then of course there, there's also the question of health insurance and there's a life insurance uh, uh, component I should say as well in uh, in participation with the pension fund there's a not a very very big life insurance policy but there's a life insurance uh, in there as well um, again, the diocese requires that uh, clerics should be insured by, their, uh, by, their, uh, by the church insurance company or whatever method we're using right now, but uh, the parishes have to make sure that their clergy are covered by insurance, health, life, and dental. Um, a question that arises uh, sometimes is what happens if, oh, and I should say, we'll hear more about insurance along the way. That's a very touchy or a very complicated subject, especially now um, with the whole health insurance uh, adjustment that we're, we've been going through. But uh, the question sometimes arises, what happens if your cleric is married and the spouse has insurance? And so the, the cleric could be insured under the spouse's insurance which is better than or cheaper than the church insurance, what happens then? Well, there are a number of different, of different options that you could follow there. Well, one would be to, uh, if, uh, if the cleric is insured under the spouse's work insurance and there's a, there's a payment or premium for that, the church could pay that and pay less than they would otherwise. Um, or they, they don't, it doesn't cost them anything or they give part of that to the cleric. There are a number of different ways that could be handled. The most important thing, and this is what Valerie was mentioning a minute ago about the um, professional expense allowance, the most important thing is that as a congregation, either in your ongoing life or especially if you're in a search, that you have that amount for insurance in your calculations so you know what is the total cost of clergy support. Give you an easy example, if you've got uh, Father Jones who's there for 15 years and you've never had to insure him because he was insured under his wife's work insurance, then he retires and you've got to look for somebody else and all of a sudden you realize, oh my goodness, this is going to cost us a lot of money. You have to, have to be aware of what the uh, financial responsibilities are. Any questions on that? Yes, Cecilia. That's, that's coming up, I think, on the next slide, the, the requirement for part-time clergy, yes. Is there a provision on that for the clergy spouse has the insurance of other sort about covering the cost of that insurance? Well, they have, I, right, yes. Step on over here. Yeah, this is important stuff. As of July 1st, if the church were to pay the spouse or the clergy person 
to reimburse them for a, uh, for a premium that was paid. Uh, the fine for that is $100 per day per employee, not to exceed uh, $33,000 in a year, okay? So you may not compensate anyone uh, in lieu of insurance, okay? Now, the way to do that is, very carefully, if you're, if, if you're saving $5,000 a year or $10,000 a year, put it in as compensation and make that part of the, the clergy compensation. But it cannot be paid, otherwise you're paying insurance premiums and under the Affordable Care Act, you're in very, very dangerous waters. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is very, very specific as to who gets insurance, who pays for it, and, and uh, on and so forth. But the, uh, you'll see in my presentation, and I have that written in the handout that I'll give you, please, Vestry, do not compensate uh, the clergy person in cash to offset the benefit that is, that is being provided by the spouse. You're in very dangerous what is doing that. And as of July 1st, there are very, very strict penalties for doing that. Yes, sir. Yeah, see, what happens is when you give money away, we mentioned this before, any time a person has what is called constructive receipt, okay, that's income. Any time you pay somebody anything, it's, and they have use of the money themselves, it's called constructive receipt. If the money is paid directly to the insurance company, that's a different story. Now you're paying premiums, but you're not giving the money to the cleric. What we have found is that monies that are given to the cleric to offset the insurance, in most cases, are not, are not declared at all. And that's not right. Yes. No, no, you may never, never directly compensate in any cash way the cleric for that. If the premium went directly to the insurance company, you're fine, okay? That's it, it can't be a disguised insurance premium. That's pretty much what it looks like, okay? Did you get that? You know, it, 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 the main thing is to make sure that you're not paying the clergy person directly because there you have constructive receipt. If you're paying an insurance premium, that's different. That's different. Yes, sir. Exactly. Overall compensation because now it's being reported on a W-2, the clergy person is paying taxes on that. Exactly, exactly. Now, the only thing is be careful there, because if you say it is in lieu of, and as soon as you mention health care or insurance, you got a problem, okay? Uh, we had a situation where a number of our businesses would, would, would change, switching over and doing that, and we said, please don't do it this year, because it looks like it's disguised reimbursement for insurance premiums. There's a controversial way, another way to do this, where instead of it, in, it, you could get more cash stipend income in order to offset some of these, again, that would be taxable. Um, there's a possibility, if the church chooses to do it, to put more money into a 403B. So instead of saying, um, it, 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 like in the secular world, people have uh, employer contributions to the 401k. So essentially, this would be an employer contribution to the 403b as a way to offset some of that, some of the cost. Um, I know of some churches that do this, um, and it's, again, because the the cleric doesn't take direct ownership of it when they, when it comes time, they do have to pay taxes on it. But um, it's a way to add to the compensation because they're not getting the health care. Um, 
it's just another way to do it. Um, and we're not saying that that's right or wrong, but it is legal. Mm -hmm. What's that? The question has to do with the relative cost uh, and experience of insuring a cleric, a single cleric, as distinct from a married cleric and or a married cleric with a family. If you have a long experience as a congregation of having unmarried clerics and now you have a married cleric or a married cleric with a family, is the congregation required to pay for the insurance for the whole uh, partnership or, or family. Uh, the Benefits Committee is gonna talk about that. Yes, did you? Yeah. I'm told that under the Affordable Care Act, and I, I, I gave you the, the caveat earlier, I'm not an expert on it. I don't think anybody's an expert on the Affordable Care Act, but I'm told that if you're gonna cover one, you have to cover them all. So they have to be, they do have to be covered, but I'm sure the Benefits Committee will talk about that more and know more about it than, uh, than I do, or we do. Part-time clergy, this came up. Um, we use the term working units. Uh, of course, clergy, it's uh, like many other occupations or, uh, or vocations, it's really hard to quantify exactly what your working time is, but we use this term working units, uh, which is roughly two and a half to four hours, uh, and full time is obviously enough to make a person full time. Um, three quarter time, nine working units, half time, six working units. This is a way to try to understand for a congregation what your expectation is of your cleric. We expect you to be giving a half a time's worth of uh, attention to your ministry here and we're going to compensate you for that. Um, so all of the aspects of compensation are appropriately negotiated. Um, if you're active, whether you're full-time, part-time, three-quarter time, you have to have that pension assessment paid in any case. Yes? Uh, what, the working unit thing? That's per week. So that's per week. So, I mean, if you will figure, roughly speaking, um, you know, at the top end, four hours, 12 working units, that's 48 hours a week, that's full-time, or three hours uh, for 12, 36 hours a week, you know. Yes, you look puzzled by this. Right. Right, exactly. 12 working, and remember, this is rough, roughly speaking, because you can never say, uh, you know, I just spent six hours in meditation for my sermon, uh, which everybody knows is only going to be nine minutes long, right? Um, but that's, <laughs> that's what I'm told. <laughs> um, that is... Uh, it is a rough estimation for the purpose of uh, calculating what it is that you expect. Yeah. That, uh, the, the, working, the question is explaining the working unit and uh, two and a half to four hours, it's, it's a range because it is kind of uh, hard to define, but because so much of what you do is not, we don't clock in. Um, but whether it's uh, study or pastoral calling or Sunday church or whatever it is, uh, it, has, it has to do with a, a general idea of how much time is going to be put into this. Yeah. 19 hours. That's a good question. I suppose that would be about half time. <laughs> about half time. Yeah. If you think of the day as morning, afternoon, and evening, because as clergy, we work a lot at night. In fact, in some of our letters of agreement, there's limited of how many nights we can work, or at least they try to, especially those with family. So the idea here was to say, how many blocks of time during the week are you 
are you working? So if you look at a, at a seven day week, you've got um, 30 or 20, 21, essentially morning, noon, or evening blocks of time. So for those of us who are here on a Saturday morning, we can say we've worked two blocks of time, morning and afternoon. Um, so it's just, it's a way to essentially quantify and so it, it, uh, help people know when you're going to be around. Two units, two units, right. And it's, this is not intended to be a clock in thing, uh, but it is, it is a, a rough estimate because obviously a morning could be two and a half hours or it could be four hours after, but, but it's how much time are you allocating to that ministry? You've got it, good, okay. Um, and as Art said a bit ago, if you're receiving more than $200 uh, over a three-month period from the same source, you have to have a pension assessment paid. So you can't try to slide out of the pension fund uh, expectation by doing this on a part-time or limited-time basis. Yes? Right. I think it's a continuous. Sure, sure. Right. Uh, it, I think it is a continuous thing. And the whole idea is to, the whole idea is to avoid that long-term supply thing. So, yeah, and certainly... Many congregations are in that position, especially since there are a fairly limited number of supply clergy around in a lot of places. And so, yeah, you might have one person three or four times in a year, which is going to add up to more than that. But it is a continuous kind of a thing. Yep. Well, we, we have to go with the canons. <laughs> we ha and and Ce Cecilia's point is that the canons uh, state that for part-time clergy, um, health insurance and things of that sort are not a requirement, but that the uh, expectation or the encouragement has been to prorate that so that if a cleric is half-time, say, you, the congregation would pay for half of the expense of the, of the health insurance. But that's a recommendation I don't believe enshrined in canons anywhere. John just whispered in my ear, if the cleric works 30 hours a week, it is required. In, in, yes, it's, it, it, in, in, other, in other realms, it is considered full-time. It's for, Then it's negotiable. Then it's negotiable. Um, so yeah, we're just we wanted to make sure that it, I mean, it, most of us think of the forty-hour work week, but I mean, if you're working thirty hours, it's still considered full time. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Yes. And finally, we get to the question of retired clergy, and uh, this is not something that I'm an expert on because I, it's, it's a while toward retirement yet. But um, retired clergy can still uh, earn money and receive their pension uh, payments. Um, if you have a question about that, ask church pension fund or church pension group, uh, or ask, of course, the diocesan office. Uh, Social Security, that's a different issue. You need to check with Social Security if you're retired and looking at uh, how much you can uh, earn and still receive Social Security uh, and Medicare benefits. If, and this is important, 
If, as a retired cleric, you receive housing compensation, housing subsidy, uh, that has to be included in the calculation. You can't say that, uh, well, I, you know, such and such parish is paying me uh, you know, $25,000 and providing housing, so I'm just gonna count the $25,000. The, the whole thing has to be included in how much you're being compensated um, if, if you're working as a retired cleric. Yes? I don't know if benefits is going to address that issue or not. Uh, I should clarify. I don't know if the benefits committee is going to address social security and, and issues of that sort. That's, that's not my bailiwick.